a very warm welcome to Dancing the Divide, Navigating Competing Discourses in Education, Part 2. And before I do a brief introduction, I'm going to hand straight over to um, Professor Robin Newey, who will give us an acknowledgement of country. Good morning, everyone, and welcome from Professor Michael Anderson and I, uh, as well as Virginia as co-directors of CREATE. We want to acknowledge now with deep respect the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first Australians. We all share their lands, winds and waters. And we want to acknowledge that their continuing and enduring cultures deepen and enrich the life of our nation and communities. We pay respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge the story and the arts are at the heart of Aboriginal ways of knowing, being and becoming. And we have so much to learn from the holistic and curricula that their children experience. At the University of Sydney, we're on um, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. You may wish to acknowledge the country on which uh, you are zooming in on today. And just to acknowledge as well that Aboriginal land was never ceded, it was stolen. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Thank you, Robin. Now, once again, welcome to part two of Dancing the Divide. I'm Virginia Moller, CEO of Steiner Education Australia, and really excited about being in partnership with Sydney University's CREATE Centre and uh, with Robin and Michael. So thank you for all that you are doing. If you missed last Wednesday's OnCon, you can catch up on all the presentations via the CREATE YouTube and Thomas has sent a link to all participants. And last week, there, it re really was a rich offering. There was the inspiring acknowledgement of country from Auntie Mun Andrews, who gave an amazing Indigenous perspective on dancing the divide. We had the great provocation on reimagining education from Robin and the wisdom and insights from uh, Professor M uh, Michael Anderson as he challenged us with the why and how of transformational change in schools and how schools can take control of transformation by reconsidering and reimagining their values, learning, pedagogy and curriculum. I mean, what a lovely task. And teacher education as well. Oh, and leadership as a coherent whole. What a challenge. We were engaged, we, we enjoyed the engaging creative interlude from Talia Wallace from Sanford Valley Steiner School. And there have been inquiries of, um, about Talia's uh, wonderful um, song and they are easily available on YouTube, I believe. And maybe Thomas could put the link to that in the chat. We had the interactive workshop sessions with Nicola Steeny on kinesthetic learning. And this was a perfect example of finding the wiggle room, literally. And Nicola's provided a wonderful presentation slide set, which Thomas sent out to all participants this week. I encourage you to watch it. Dr. Nikki Brunker gave us some homework. It's inevitable, the homework. In preparation for the session today on finding the creative wiggle room. Thank you to people who posted their insights on Padlet. They were, I really enjoyed reading them. They were rich observations that we can build on in group session today. Don't worry if the homework's not completed. There's plenty of opportunity today to find the wriggle room together. And as I said, I encourage you to re-look at part one, which is available on the Create YouTube. And key ideas that came out for me were keeping Indigenous perspectives, as Robin alluded to, on other ways of knowing and being keeping them to the fore as we reimagine education. Another key idea, 
Dancing a Divide, Robin um, presented to us. Dancing a Divide of mainstream reductive traditional discourse and, and the divide between that and more authentic discourse about what we know about the way we learn and who we are as human beings. Wonderful concept of finite and infinite gains. Sustainable transformation involves coherence. Movement is essential to learning at all levels, including and especially the high school. Today builds on the stories and perspectives from last session, as Matthew Kinane invites us to explore the role imagination plays in our ability to think critically and creatively. We have another creative interlude from um, Angus Spark from Sanford Valley Steinsville. I'm really looking forward to that. And Nikki Brunker will lead the group um, to get deeper thinking going on finding where we're going. And we finish with a panel discussion. Plenty of time for rich discussion and plans for action. As with last week, it's a very two hours to keep the imagination alive, to keep the space open for new ideas to emerge and new actions to be taken. Please enter any questions and comments into chat as we go. We want your participation every step of the way. We want this to be practical and clear outcomes for moving forward. Now it's over to Matthew, who is Matthew Kinane, who's currently completing a PhD in the area of imagination and also has extensive experience as a teacher, school leader, education consultant, and initial teacher educator at Melbourne University. So over to you, Matthew. Thank you, Virginia. Hopefully you can hear me. Hello, everyone. Um, just to let you know, uh, the apartment that I am in has uh, construction going on, uh, literally on the building. So I've had to stick my head out the window and, and ask somebody who's dangling from a rope to please stop drilling into the side of the room while I'm talking to you. So. It may get a little bit loud in here. I apologize for that. Um, if that, that occurs, if it gets too much, we'll just have to come up with a plan B. Okay. Um, now, I thought I would flip the script a little bit with you today. Uh, instead of going straight into um, dialoguing with you and then uh, coming back and saying, now let's talk about what that all means. I thought we should start with some interaction. So, um, I will give you, a, for this session, there's a couple of things that we're gonna to wanna to have available to you. Ideally, you will have something to draw with and to write with. Paper and pencil is great. If you wanna get out your, uh, your crayons, your charcoals, whatever you want, something to just do any sketching with. You're going to, I'm gonna ask you to sketch. Of course, if you don't want to participate, that is completely fine. But ideally, we're going to try to be interactive here. So we're gonna be doing some writing, we're gonna be doing some drawing, um, and hopefully we'll also be doing some discussing here as well. Okay, in addition to that, I'm hoping to get some feedback from you as we're going through. And there's two ways uh, that in a group of this side on Zoom, that it's easiest to get that feedback. And that's using the uh, reactions button down in the bottom of your screen. So if you have a look, you should be able to see, for those of you who aren't uh, Zoom aficionados, a button that has a smiley face on it, an icon at the bottom of your screen that says reactions. If you click that, um, you should be able to see that you've got some options there, like uh, some claps and thumbs up. That's great. Okay. Uh, in addition to that, if you click on the participants button there, you should also get something. Uh, am I right here? Or is, where you can actually um, put a thumbs up and a thumbs down. Can you see that? So you should be able to get a, or yes or a no, sorry, it's yes or no on, on this one, isn't it? Okay. So you can click those. Yes, so if you click that, you can possibly give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. You might need to click the button that says more. Okay, so in a little bit, hopefully I'll be asking you to uh, give us a yes or a thumbs up or a no or a thumbs down. Um, in one of the activities we're doing. Again, apologies about the noise. Hopefully, is it, is it unbearable, Virginia? We're okay? All right. that's, that's fantastic. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen with you and then we'll get started.
Hopefully you can see that shortly. I don't know if that's come through for you. Has that come through? Great. All being well, you're seeing a quote now from uh, Stoner. Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so as we've only got half a- Half your screen. Um, Sorry? I'm only seeing half your screen. Is everyone else? That's better. Now I can see it. It's resolved? Okay, fantastic. Yeah, okay. Um, we've only got uh, 15 minutes uh, of, well, half an hour altogether, 15 minutes for, for discussion parts, so I'm going to go quite quickly, and I'm only going to attempt to make uh, one point with you today, uh, and that has to do with this particular quote from Rudolf Steiner about imaginative cognition. He makes a, a distinction here in Health and Illness Part 1, um, where, sorry, this noise is really bothering me. <laughs> Bear with me for a second, would you? I'll be right back. Okay, um, the distinction that he's drawing here is between the imagination or the uh, imaginative thinking of the artist uh, and that of the imaginative thinking of, well, as you would say, a spiritual scientist. But in this particular case, we can think of it in more general terms. So the imagination for an artist, he is arguing, is bound to the physical. In other words, what can we make? What can we produce? limits what we're thinking about. Whereas when we free ourselves from that particular notion, we're able to think uh, with fewer boundaries. That's the element that I'm looking at today, how we bring that creative imaginative thinking to bear in the classroom. And the distinction that uh, I feel it's important to make here is that this is somewhat contrary to what is tends to be uh, taught, particularly in Victoria, I'm assuming it's the same in other states as well, to uh, new teachers about direct instruction models, which are highly effective for making sure that clear, discrete pieces of knowledge and information are understood by students, which is really valuable. But unfortunately, they can sometimes leave us without a lot of contextual depth and content to attach those to. So we're going to play with the notion of, uh, of how we can actually build that notion, uh, these elements up. And this is in somewhat, well, primarily this is in contrast to what we normally see as a Bloom's taxonomy, where we're going from uh, a know, understand, apply, analyze, and or in the old model, create at the top. And this creation that happens at the top of our Bloom's taxonomy suggests that there is an order of thinking that we need to get to go through before students can create. And there's a lot of literature that supports that, that says we need that other those other elements before students can use that. But that use is, I'm, I'm challenging that with you today. I'm suggesting that actually we can come to it uh, before we go through all of those other critical cognitive steps. Let's have a play, see what we do. Okay, so the first task I'm gonna ask you to do just now is a really simple one. I'd like you to think of a red door. And I want you to try to visualize that door and then perhaps start with a little bit of a description of that door that you're seeing. And then write a, just a short story for just a couple of minutes. You don't, no need to try to finish the story. You just want to start writing out as, uh, what happens uh, in front, as you're in front of that door and you go through the door what is on the other side. So I'm going to give you uh, two minutes and I will mute myself so you don't hear the background noise yep. uh, to do that.
Okay, I realize you probably haven't finished writing what you are, but uh, uh, we can stop there for the moment. The next part of this for us, though, is to uh, just identify what was the dominant mood or genre of your of your story when you saw that door. What came to your mind first? What did you work with? We can share those things and we'll gather them all together. There's, there's, uh, we're going to use something called Answer Garden, which is a word cloud based thing, which I'll, there's a link to it in the chat there. Uh, you can also see the link there on the slide, hopefully. And if you're um, one of the people who's able to do these things, there's a QR code for you as well. So you can use your phone if you'd rather do it that way. So if you can just pop simple words in there, what was the genre, the mood of your story? Uh, perhaps some single word descriptions of your door. What were some of the elements that you saw when you saw that door? And I'll, I'll leave you to give you a minute there to populate that. Okay. Well, I'll leave it there for the moment if we can. We'll come back to that in, in a little while. Thank you for doing that. We're going to move on to a slightly different activity, but just to take a moment there, we can think about what happened for us. And perhaps if you want to note that down, you can too, in terms of uh, where did that image, did that, the, when you saw the door at first, what was it uh, reminding you of? Was it a door that you actually experienced? Uh, was it a door that uh, seemed new to you? Did you recall a, a door? Perhaps you've got a red door in your house. Um, so what happened there? All right. Now, but we want to switch gears here. We're going to do another little activity to start with, and we'll come back to that one. This one's going to need us to draw. So you'll need a piece of paper and a pencil or something to draw with. And we're going to just do a quick sketch here. Uh, this time, what we want to do is we're doing a portrait. So basically, like a Zoom portrait here, we can all see uh, the heads and shoulders of each other here. So we just want to draw the, the portrait of this individual. But the only thing I'm going to give you, uh, other than the 90 seconds to two minutes that uh, we'll have to do it, uh, is the person's name. So it's just what comes to mind. That's what we're trying to capture. It doesn't have to be good. We're not trying to be artistically, uh, you know, uh, perfect here. It's a sketch. Uh, okay, so I should give you the person's name and then you're ready to draw. Ready to go? Fantastic. Here's the name. Wilbur Olin Atwater. What does Wilbur Olin Atwater look like? I'll give you a couple, about 90 seconds.
all right. Now, I imagine we still need more time, but uh, given the shortness of our time available to us, this is where we are now. So what I'd like you to do, uh, if you're able to, and you're willing to share that image with us, just out of curiosity, uh, there's a, a link again, this time to a Padlet. I'll pop it in the chat window for you there. Uh, and of course, if you want to use the QR code with your phone, that'll make it easy too. There's instructions there on the Padlet site for you to how to share that picture. Uh, but basically, it's just like you did uh, when you did uh, uh, the Padlet for uh, Nikki last week. You just click on the plus button and you'll see that there's a little camera icon on the bottom of that uh, bar, uh, that box that opens up for you. Just click on that and you can go ahead and just take a photo and share it that way. What's interesting for us as you're doing this is that we can recognize that in both instances, uh, for the vast majority of, of people, something comes up. We get a, uh, an image of that door, definitely shows up. And for a lot of us, a face appears based on a name alone. We can see this person. So what will be interesting to see is how similar these all are uh, in the end. So what's actually happening there? All right. Very good. And that's, uh, I think, have we all managed it? I'm going to go ahead and share, actually. So Wilbur Olin Atwater is an actual person. That's an actual uh, individual's name uh, here. And this is Wilbur. So you can have a look at uh, your drawing and you can have a look at uh, Wilbur himself there and see just out of curiosity how close we actually were to the real thing. So I'm gonna change gears with you here for a moment. We're gonna do yet another one. We can. So in the first instance, we had, uh, I asked you to visualize uh, something based on some words, a, a door, and then create a story around that door. So we wound up creating a mood, if you will, uh, based on that visualization. That's the important part for there. And the second one, I asked you to draw a picture uh, this time and sort of write uh, based on, again, only just a statement, this, a person's name. But we wound up getting a, a sense of something coming up there. We created something on the base of this. I'm going to ask you to do the same thing again, but I'm going to give you a slightly different context. Okay, so we're going to uh, work with this notion here, finance. So what I'd like you to do now, and this is your choice uh, here, is to uh, choose which one of these presents as the easiest for you to, uh, in this regard. In terms of finance, draw a picture of finance write a description or explanation of finance if you find that easier than drawing a picture or create a mind map of other concepts that you relate to finance. Mind map finance, for you, in other words. Whichever one of those you find easiest. And again, we'll only take a minute or so to do this because we are already running out of time.
Okay. Now, I know you haven't finished that task either, but uh, again, time is pressing. So I'd like you to now think about, first of all, you've chosen one of those three things. So you could enter for me into the chat window. That's probably the easiest way to do it. Which one of the three options you chose? Did you choose one, two, or three? Well, uh, you can all see that the, we're getting a range of responses there um, with threes and twos being the, the most dominant there. When we have a look at this a little bit further, uh, if you chose one and you drew a picture of finance, uh, why don't you uh, go ahead and label the elements in there. What did you actually draw? So if you draw, for instance, a picture of, of money, uh, then we, we know what we've drawn. If you draw a bank, then it's, a, it's what we drew was a bank. Have a check through, label what you can see that you actually drew. What we're trying to do is find out which part of that was actually the part that we would label the finance part. Uh, if you wrote something, um, you can think, how would I sketch this? What would this look like? What would be the visual that would help uh, explain this, what I wrote down? And third, uh, if you did the mind map, you can highlight, underline, circle, whatever you need to do uh, to emphasize the things that are tangible in your mind map. Again, so if you, if you put down in your mind map money, banking, these sorts of things, you can identify, well, which one of these things are tangibles? How are we going on time, Virginia? You have uh, until probably about um, 10.45. Okay. Well, then I'm gonna have to, uh, I'll have to pick up the pace. Otherwise we'll just have been uh, doing fun activities and we want to get to the main point. And Matthew, yes. we're, we have a panel discussion as well at the end. Okay. So anybody who's got questions, please put them into chat and they'll be picked up as well if we run out of time and we can pick it up again in the panel. Okay, so let's have a, a quick check in if I could. Thank you for uh, bearing with me. Hopefully these were uh, at least entertaining for you all. Um, I'm gonna share with you the, the, the word cloud. Hopefully that comes through here for you uh, that we created when we thought about the doors. Virginia, can you let me know if that shows up? Yes, it does. Okay. So what we can see there is that uh, obviously fantasy seems to be the dominant theme. And when we read around there, there's a lot of curiosity uh, and some fear, possibly some cautiousness, uh, not welcome, facing your fears, uh, nervous, yeah, dark mysteries. All of these things are associated with just the phrase red door. Why? When we think about this, actually, there's only one word in there that's actually doing any heavy lifting, and it's red. There's one descriptive word, red. Yeah. The door, if I just simply said, think of a door, well, our concepts could be wide. It could be anything for you, couldn't it? But the red has focused our minds. The specificity has come from that one contextual element of red. And what we see arising out of that is that there tends to be uh, an association. And that's really what's happening here. We've got an associative recall. Our, a simple process is occurring for us. Yeah? We are recalling something from memory. Yeah? And we're adapting. Recall and adapt. This is our imagination at work uh, for us. And in this particular case, it's brought up, what do we associate with red and what do we associate with doors? And it's put those two things together. Yeah. Now you may have recently read a book where a red door featured, you may have a red door uh, that uh, in, in your past that, you, that you've called on. But as you can see, we've got a, 
a continuity of theme. Where is that coming from? This is, there's lots that we can draw on here, but primarily what we have to realize is that this is cultural memory at work for us. Yeah? This is our cultural understanding taking place. If we were looking at this from an Asian perspective, a Chinese perspective, uh, we probably wouldn't see so much suspense, fear, uh, uh, facing the unknown elements because red is the color of luck and a lot of doors, particularly on temples and palaces are red. Yeah. So we would have a different experience of red doors yeah, as our cultural experience and therefore a different imagination of what a red door might mean for us. But it's interesting to bring this up because we didn't do any other prompting other than that one word for us here. And we can expect, in fact, what you will find is that it's no, not, not that much different from what the students would have. So we can explore that in more detail, but we don't have time. But you can consider what happens for the young child who, who will automatically have that imaginative element that goes with red doors here who walks through Chinatown. Actually, What's Matthew, their, their experience? Just, yeah. just to interrupt, James said he went into a Chinese garden, just by the way. Yeah. James. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Very good. Let's have a look at our Wilbur Atwater pictures, uh, if we can. All right, um, a lot of a uh, lot of hats are present here, yeah, and uh, a lot of facial hair is present as well in our pictures of William Atwater and one cat. That's brilliant. Again, what we have here is a temporal memory taking place. We associate that name perhaps with a particular time. It sounds very Victorian, doesn't it? So images of Victorian um, constructs come up we're able to see that there's some parallels there that are occurring without any narrative. So we've created a situation here where we can see that, uh, again, what we're doing is we're making associations and we're making adaptations uh, for what we're thinking about. Now, that's our imagination at work. And we use, as teachers, we use the imagination all the time. Even when you don't want to, we use it. The problem comes for us then when we're dealing with things like finance, where that's the concept. What is it that we visualize when we see finance, when we say finance to students? We, we're into a different realm here. Yeah? When we start talking in, in these terms, we're talking in abstractions with students. And what you should hopefully see uh, in your, your diagrams or whatever else that you, you've done there is that actually you have lots of visualizations that are building together yeah, that make this understanding of finance. Now finance is real, yeah? it exists for us. It's non-tangible, but it exists in this different space. Yeah? It is part of our lived experience and it has real impacts on us and it has real impacts in real time. So we have a shared understanding of finance, but it is an abstraction. It lives uh, in a different part of our discourse, our social understanding than the other ones, the other elements do. Nevertheless, that a generative, imaginative element that come into play, what do we associate with it and how do we adapt and understand it? Now, this is where it gets, I can hear my time is just about up. Uh, don't worry, Matthew. No, going. here comes the drillers. <laughs> oh. um, so this is what I wanted to share with you. Uh, that's the main point. Uh, that I was hoping to get to. As you can see that when we, when we start talking about abstractions, we first must talk about the, uh, the imaginations and how they work. And what this looks like for us, oh dear, I'm gonna have to jump to the end now, Virginia. It's fine, Matthew. It's not so bad at our end. Okay. What it looks like for us is this, that we can actually say that there's a progression that we have to walk our students through in order for them to develop this imagination. So it's we work from the point of view of an automatic, which is what we've just experienced, the automatic recall and the automatic adaptation that occurs. Yeah, that's just a, a natural gift, if you will. However, we can also control that. We can start looking at intentional recalls and, yeah, or intentional adaptations. So when we add that element in for the students, we're actually helping them to not just respond, to react, but then we're starting to use that, that thinking to create. And then ultimately we can get to the point where we've got an intentional recall. What do we actually, students are actually selecting, or well, we are selecting what we're going to think about 
and how we're going to adapt it. Okay, so the recall uh, for Atwater was it's a Victorian thing, but we don't have to choose that. Yeah, we can select other things. And when we do that adaptation, we can say, well, there's the automatic adaptation, but we can suspend that automatic adaptation. We can add to it and say, well, what else could I adapt it to? Those two flexibilities of thought, controlling what we're bringing forward, looking at it, considering it, that's happening, and also how we're going to adapt it. There, in this area, I'm suggesting to you that we're working on our cognitive imagination, yeah? our imaginative thinking with students. It's quite generative. It doesn't need to be uh, something that uh, uh, you can see. I'll just show this quickly with you. No, I won't. Yes, Matthew, you keep going. Um, it's, all right, you sure you can hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, how can we actually use this in, in the classrooms? There's a couple of different ways we can do it. Uh, well, there's lots of ways we can use it. I'll show this little narrative with you. This is where I wanted you to use your thumbs up and thumbs down. So, for instance, in civics or legal studies, if this is what you're going to do, we can present the students without going through the, portion, the part where we say, here are the terms and here's the under concepts in a linear fashion. We can just simply begin with our students. And here's a story. Yeah. The burglar arm went off the National Museum of Human Knowledge in the middle of the night. Police arrived and found an individual uh, standing outside the museum with one of the exhibits in hand. Should they arrest him? Yes or no? So you could vote here. Yeah. Obviously. Now this conjures up images straight away for us. You can see you'd have to mention picture created there for the students and what they should do. But then the, the, the question prompts us to think about uh, the more abstract elements in this. And so the story would go on uh, from there. Uh, it outlines for us uh, the various elements. For instance, during the uh, interrogation, uh, the person identifies that they're out for a stroll. Um, when asked if there's anyone who could uh, verify him, uh, verify this. Uh, he says his brother could, etc. I'll share this with you separately, but you can get the sense now of what's happening. We're walking the students through. I'm rushing. I'm sorry. I'm out of time. You walk the students through this uh, scenario. This is a narrative imagination that's taking place. And what falls out of this are the concepts and the constructs that we would want to teach. And so as we go through this process, we can then circle back. And this is the part where we need a dialogue that takes place with the students to get to those concepts like finance through a Socratic dialogue to say, well, what is actually taking place? In this particular example, it's the notion, notions of values that are, that are uncovered about, well, what is proof? What is evidence? What is, what is justice? What is... Uh, and how does this work in our society? These are the key concepts that we're coming to, but we're coming through them through an imaginative experiential way. The next, when we, when we unpack those together, yeah, to get to those, well, what is finance? Those agreed mental pictures. This goes on and on, um, obviously. Uh, and it varies, of course, because once we've gone through this perspective from the point of view of, well, what would the police do or what should the investigators do? we can turn it around and ask the question, well, what should the defense uh, uh, solicitor do, the defense lawyer for this person do? And there's a whole review, which I don't have time to share with you. It also works similarly in geography. We can ask some simple questions. Where would you build a civilization? You would choose a spot. And in doing so, there would be a reason why you chose the location you chose. What was the location that you did choose? Some people choose to put their civilization or their, their settlement in the mountains. Some people choose to put it by, the, by uh, the flat land. Some people choose to put it by the water. All of these are valid options. The questions that come up out of this is, why did you choose those locations? We haven't talked about capital cities or why they should be or what, how they should work or what are the parameters. None of that has occurred. But yet everybody can choose. Yeah? And everybody can tell you why. And some students will identify that they want mountains because they're going to be more, they're concerned with protection. Some people choose lowlands because they're concerned about food. Some people choose near the water because they want access to the sea for trading, etc. All of them can do this. Yeah. 
what we then do is that we can then circle back and say, well, what is the additional information you'd like to have before you finalize that choice or about your location? And so we can see that we've got that generative element. Our imaginations go to work choosing and adapting our information. And then we start asking critical questions. What else do I need to know? And there the concepts again start, can be associated to that. I do need to stop. Um, just uh, if you did play along, even though it was very quick, um, here's some famous choices of locations that uh, occur on this particular stretch of land. This, of course, this is Greece. I cropped it so it wasn't so obvious for you. Okay, so that's really all. I've gone well over time, but uh, that's what I wanted to get you to. Apologies for the, the background noise. This notion that we can work them through this process of adaption and recall and doing that with intention. Matthew, that was extraordinary. You gave us a key concept. How do you develop imaginative thinking? How do you make it um, a coherent pedagogy, as Michael was talking about yesterday? And you've just given us an inkling uh, with uh, your presentation. And Julia has said a couple of comments. Matthew has tap just tapped the iceberg. Can we do more with Matthew and his work? Does he have further readings or other things invaluable for teachers? So maybe watch this space as Matthew develops um, his um, PhD. And we'll all watch with interest. And another comment, uh, Sui has said the power of questioning and facilitating the class. Elspeth has added the St. James Ethics Centre has great resources to explore ethical dilemmas and our own assumptions as basis for decision making. And so that's all intertwined, Matthew. Did you want to make a very last quick comment about any of that? I think the, really the, the only comment I would add to this is that we, we always work from the whole to the part and that whole to the part notion within Steiner education, it comes from the context and the content. The rich experience that we give the students is the whole. Yeah? So the imagination, those mental pictures that the students arrive at provide them the, the whole, the totality. We can't imagine it without it. Yeah? So all of those elements come to the fore. Uh, and mood is associated with it. So when we present those things to the students, this is the first step and we do that well. The second step though, is to start identifying the abstractions that cannot be identified through discourse alone with the students, where we arrive at well, what is the value, literally a moral ethical value or conceptual understanding, i.e. finance. We call this finance when money flows from one to the other. This is finance at work. Yep. These we arrive at, but we can only arrive at them through the discourse. And so the students have to have the opportunity in the, that rhythm to go through that. And as teachers, we facilitate that discourse. That is the review. So the important point I would be making for us there is that what is what we're trying to do the next day? We're not trying to do remember the story. Yeah? But we can rem they will remember the story. But rather, what rises up from the story that is inspiration? Yeah? That's what we want to arrive at. And it's, so that's where the elements come into play. We could talk about this. Uh, I could talk to the cows come home, but I'll stop. I, I know, Matthew. <laughs> and we'd love to listen. And in, uh, questions may come up, uh, come up again. We are over time, but we can make up time. I know we can. 